How's everybody doing tonight? Let's see, it is Wednesday, July 15th, 2020. Coming at you again with another movie collection update. The last one was towards the end of April. And, uh, you know, through this lockdown and pandemic, you know, since I haven't been able to travel, haven't been able to do anything, haven't been able to go out to eat, haven't been able to go to fests with my friends and stuff, you know, I've just had a lot of downtime stuck at home and a lot of extra money saved up, so I was able to get a very large assortment of movies during these past three months. And a lot of these were really cheap, too, which is why the list for this update's kind of bigger. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this one. I've definitely got some interesting things to talk about here. It's a pretty big list, so let's get right into it. Two VHS tapes. This first one, I was surprised I found this sealed, brand new, for only 25 bucks. So I just grabbed it because I know it's a collector's item. And that is the Microsoft Windows 95 Video Guide. You know, with friends getting really popular at the time. Matthew Perry and Jennifer Aniston. I'm keeping it sealed. I'm not even opening this. For those of you who want to check this out, it is on YouTube for free. It's gloriously stupid. <laughs> you know, with all these different characters. A punk rock band. A weird eccentric German janitor, a whiz kid, there's, you know, there's all these different characters that make that a really odd watch, but hey, Microsoft Windows 95, it's the way of the future, right? Now this next one, I was actually happy I found this because it's a pretty big relic of my childhood. When I was growing up as a kid, there was a, it was from the late 90s, there was this series they showed on Fox called Breaking the Magician's Code. Magic's Biggest Secrets finally revealed, and they ended up reviving it again in like, I want to say maybe 2009, 2008, somewhere around there, maybe a little bit earlier. But uh, I have a VHS tape over there of Breaking the Magician's Code, the original, Volume 1 and 2, and for a couple bucks I actually came across the VHS of Volume 3. I haven't seen this in like 11 years, so it was cool to watch Volume 3 again. And there was a Volume 4 as well. I, that was the last one. That was the one where he took his mask off. I need to try to find Volume 4, but, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's a pretty. It was pretty controversial at the time, the masked magician, and it's been parodied a lot, revealing all the secrets. And I remember on Volume 3 here you have the tank, making the tank disappear. There's one that never aired on TV in this one called Noah's Ark, which was pretty cool. You know, rearranging the girl in the box. The one you see on the cover here is actually in this one where he's throwing the knives at her. You know, cool show. It's hosted by Mitch Pileggi, which is funny. Of course, you get him making weird comments about all the scantily clad assistants. Getting into the Blu-rays now, we have The Invisible Man, brand new one. I saw this in theaters in IMAX, which is the last movie I've seen in a theater until further notice. Uh, but seeing this in IMAX, man, what a trip this was. First of all, this is just such a great movie. I, went, I avoided the trailers for the most part, so I went into The Invisible Man pretty blind. And I, was, I really liked the direction they took with it. They did a good job of really modernizing it without making it, you know, too on the nose and too preachy. Even though this movie does have a strong social message about abusive relationships and you know, how one can feel really trapped by them, it handles it with gusto. Elizabeth Moss does awesome. There's some genuinely shocking scenes in this, and it's just so tense. Like, I was sitting there watching this thing in IMAX, you know, there's all these shots where they just linger on nothing, and it's just like, man, like, what a... T <laughs> it's, it's a good time. And so, for anyone who hasn't seen The Invisible Man yet, you know, definitely check it out. I remember being very surprised. Definitely one of the best horror experiences I've had in a theater. Because I saw the Halloween reboot and the Child's Play remake. I saw those. And, you know, those are fun, entertaining movies. But for genuine suspense and stuff, 
Now that one had me going. Now this one was actually gifted to me, which was, you know, very cool. You know, thank you. This is a movie, I had actually shown this like a year ago, but the DVD I have of it is like this platinum DVD, you know, it's bare bones, the picture quality at best is like a laser disc rippy. It was always kind of an obscure one and always kind of out of print and not that easy to find. But now, thankfully, there is a special edition Blu-ray re-release of Mirror Mirror with Rainbow Harvest and Karen Black. I won't go into the movie too much because I had already talked about it before. This is from a company called Dark Force Entertainment, Dark Force Superstore. And I always like these special edition Blu-rays, companies like that and Vinegar Syndrome, because these weird little obscure gems like this are usually always the funnest to hear about and have the funnest stories from the production and this one is no different it's got an interview with the producers uh, or the names Jimmy Lifton and I think the other one was Virginia Perfili you could tell they're definitely kind of kooky people more of a musician background and the movie looks great. I rewatched it because I hadn't seen it, you know, since last year when I watched the the platinum DVD I got, and it looks almost like an entirely new movie. They did such a good job just making it crystal clear and recolorizing it. And it looks awesome, like one of the best older obscure Blu-ray transfers that I've seen. And it is a good movie. I do really like Mirror Mirror. The only thing with this, it's just the ending. I still don't understand the way this movie ends. So if someone can please explain the ending of Mirror Mirror to me. And, and I've never, there's like three sequels to that, which I don't intend on seeing. I This one's good enough, so I, I don't know what you could do with a sequel. But if you haven't seen it, you know, that Blu-ray, it's worthwhile to get, you know, the transfer's great, cool interview on there. Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend Mirror Mirror. Now this one I'm excited to talk about. <laughs> and this is probably a controversial opinion too, because I've read a lot of negative things about this. A lot of people hate it. It has a four point something on IMDb. I disagree. I, I'm just going to say this right here. I fucking loved this movie. And I'm going to defend it right now in saying it's a horrible case of mismarketing. I don't know what it was originally intended. I don't know what the original draft of the script was originally intended to be. It's from 1989. It stars Roy Scheider. It's called Night Game. You look at this poster, and you look at that title, you would assume it's just a straight-ahead horror slasher movie. And I'm here to tell you right now, it, that's not what this is. But I love this. So, basically what Night Game is, it's a cop procedural mostly there are some horror slasher scenes in there and they're definitely really well filmed it's a really well directed movie but the thing with this movie that makes me really love it is that it's just so weird so you haven't because the vibe of it it feels like you took three episodes of some crazy 80s cop show and you just put them together. That's Night Game, because while you have the police procedural aspect and you have the slasher aspect, you just have all this weird, random, sitcom-level shit that's happening. You have Roy Scheider's character, who's the main detective on this case of this serial killer. But then you have these subplots where Roy Scheider's fiance is like half his age, and his soon-to-be mother-in-law is his ex-girlfriend. <laughs> and there's all this weird shit. It's got no place in the movie. But I loved it. I was entertained watching it. And there's just all this odd comedy with the police officers. Like, the police station in this, there's Roy Scheider. There's the stereotypical Texan sergeant. You have the, this guy who's always eating. He orders a pizza to a crime scene at one of the murders, and 
the, the rookie cop who throws up every time he sees a body. Paul Gleason is in this, playing his usual asshole cop role. You get to see Roy Scheider dance, and it's fucking hilarious. And even the killer is played by Rex Lynn, and he's got a hook for a hand. And it's just such a bonkers movie. And you guys know me. If you follow my updates regularly, you know I go for the obscure shit. And this just had my name all over it. It's so weird. It's so obscure. If you like obscure, goofy 80s cop shows, you're going to love this. And if you love slasher movies on top of that, then this is taboo because there's some great slasher scenes in this. There's one in a carnival funhouse in this that was really well done. But you get a lot of goofy, goofy shit along with it, so... Just be prepared, but if you like your obscure, goofy, 80s, sh just bizarre stuff, give this one a shot, because I actually really love like it. I might be the only person on the planet who's saying that about that, but I loved it. It was just such a weird, obscure experience. DVDs, we have One Crazy Summer which I love. I've seen this before, I never owned it, finally got around to picking up this old DVD of it. You know, One Crazy Summer, Savage Steve Holland, John Cusack, it's essentially like a, it could almost have been a spiritual sequel to Better Off Dead. It's very much in the same vein. I didn't see this until last year. I watched it last summer and really enjoyed it. So finally picked up the DVD of it. John Cusack, Curtis Armstrong, not only in addition to the Better Off Dead people, you've got Bobcat Goldthwait and Demi Moore. And you, this is just a perfect summer movie. The whole thing takes place at you know, this beach with this sailboat regatta race. Mark Metcalf is your bad guy, you know, typical 80s fashion. Great soundtrack. And there's some stuff that genuinely cracked me up in this movie. Bobcat Goldthwait, you know, he's doing his usual shtick from the 80s. There's a Godzilla scene in this. It's not even that funny, but it cracked me up. You know, it ends with... Diane Franklin was originally supposed to be in this at the end, but her scene got cut. And I gotta say, this DVD has a commentary with Bobcat Goldthwait, Savage Steve Howland, and Curtis Armstrong. It is one of the most entertaining commentaries I've heard in a very long time. It was, it was very... The way they're... They're talking about it and everything. It was very entertaining. It's worth it just for the commentary. But the, the film itself is just hilarious. It's such a summer movie. I'm going to turn it into a summer ritual where I watch it every summer. So, on. Throat's getting a little dry. All right. Pardon me, this is going to be the most exciting part of the update right here. Pardon me while I go grab a drink of water. I don't want to cut it because I don't want to have to edit such a long video. So be right back, let me grab a water really quick. I don't know, you could jerk off or something in the time being. I'll be right back. My throat is like so dry. That hits the spot. All right. After that excitement, oh, keep that up here. We have the long kiss good night, which somehow I had never seen up until this point. I'm not going to go into this too much because, you know, this is a pretty common one. I'm pretty late to the party on it. If you're watching this, you've probably already seen it. It's great. It's really suspenseful. It's really tense. The action scenes are awesome. And you have a really funny Shane Black script. To, you know, I love Last Boy Scout. You know, Lethal Weapons, obviously. This is no exception. And you have Rennie Harlan directing it. That's pretty much a sign of quality right there. I, To this day, I have not seen a Rennie Harlan movie that I don't like. So if he's attached, you know, I'll give it a shot. Yeah, Samuel L. Jackson, Gina Davis. 
the villain in this movie is the only weak spot. I, I thought the guy playing the villain was kind of oddly cast. Uh, he just didn't seem like the type of villain you would see in, in something like this. So. That was one weird thing, but for the most part, it's really entertaining, really funny. The action, the finale is just so overblown. It's awesome. So yeah, if, if you're like me and you somehow missed the long kiss goodnight, you gotta check this one out. It's great. Alright, ooh. Now this one was a total blind buy. You know, it was just, two, that was two dollars and this was also two dollars. So I said, a lot of these I got for a buy. And the next one I'm going to talk about is two dollars as well. It's a double feature of Drop Zone and Hard Rain. Starting with Hard Rain, holy hell, as far as production design and sets go, Hard Rain has to be one of the most impressive things I've ever seen because I knew nothing. I had never seen it before. I would love to see a making of documentary on Hard Rain because they flooded a city <laughs> for the making of it. You cannot convince me otherwise. They flooded a city. You have an awesome um, you have an awesome cast where you have Christian Slater as your lead, and I always like Christian Slater. Morgan Freeman is your antagonist. You've got Randy Quaid. You've got this other guy, I forget his name. He was in the movie Body Parts. He was in Seinfeld. He's one of the cops in this. And you also have Betty White. Because Christian Slater, Morgan Freeman, Randy Quaid, and Betty White in this tense thriller disaster film. Hard rain, but it was really well done. And there's this crazy scene where it's a jet ski chase through a school, and that's not a sentence I ever thought would come out of my mouth. I don't know how hard rain missed my radar. Really good, really good. However, Drop Zone, holy shit, I loved Drop Zone. I, this is the definition of why the fuck have I not seen this movie earlier? got Wesley Snipes, you've got Gary Busey as your villain, which, you know, law of life for me. If Gary Busey's in something, it automatically warrants me watching it. Drop Zone, it's like you took Passenger 57, Point Break, Miami Vice, and Die Hard, and cram them all into the same thing. I Drop Zone is the definition of a brainless, stupid, popcorn, fun action movie. And it's getting rarer and rarer to impress me with stuff like this just because I've started to see so many different films. I was sitting there watching Drop Zone, I'm smiling, I'm clapping, I'm, I was like a little kid watching it and I just had so much fun. You know, some parts are tense, like the plane scene at the beginning is fairly well done and pretty tense and suspenseful, but then you just get goofy shit, like Gary Busey biting the guy's finger off, and the entire finale turns into Die Hard, but there's so much, like, comedy thrown in and ridiculous, ridiculous stuff that Drop Zone is one of my new favorite action movies that I've seen period. Like, I love Drop Zone. And so the fact I bought this set totally blindly, and both of these turned out to be such good, underrated thing, movies, I can't recommend this highly enough. If I don't know, I don't know if either of these have a Blu-ray release or not. It's bare bones for both of them, unfortunately. I would love to hear more about both. Yeah, I, I fucking love Drop Zone. And Hard Rain was really good, too. Two very strong action films. And same thing with this. Another $2 one from the same, you know, little thrift store. I don't know how I... I had heard about this one. I knew of this f movie. See, I feel like I say the word movie a million times in these updates. I'm trying to, trying to not sound so repetitive, so I'm... I keep catching myself. Do I say movie? Do I say film? Do I say thing? So forgive me on that, but I had heard about this film 
for a long time. I knew of its existence. I knew of its plot. I just never got around to seeing it. So I finally took the opportunity to watch Phone Booth. And what can I say? It was awesome. I, I really loved it. It's, you know, it's not like it's wall-to-wall -wall action or anything, though there is some action in it. It's suspenseful. It's tense. The journey you follow of Colin Farrell's character is great. And, you know, he gives an awesome emotional performance, like, as soon as the third act hits. And it's a very short movie, too. By the time the end credits start rolling, it's, like, at the 75-minute mark. There's a making of on YouTube of it, which is really interesting, because they made this whole thing in like 10 days. And there's an audio commentary on there with Joel Schumacher. No, rest in peace, Joel Schumacher. I got this right after he passed away. This was one of the later films I got for this update. And so I watched it, finally in his honor, and it was awesome. If you somehow haven't seen Phone Booth yet, it's another one. I'm late for the party. Definitely check it out. It's worth a watch. And a movie, it's only like 75 minutes long by the time the end credits start rolling. So, you know, how can you hate a movie like that? All right, now these next, these next, yeah, these next few are all bootlegs. I've got a lot of bootlegs here because I've got a lot of friends online that have websites and stuff. And they cut me some good deals on some of these. So, first one is a TV movie from 1977 called Flight to Holocaust which was actually going to be the pilot for a TV show. You got Patrick Wayne and Chris Mitchum, you know, relatives of famous people. They play like these rescue team type people. I thought this was going to be really cool because the movie starts with this guy that's up on a cell tower or like a radio tower, whatever it maybe it's 1977 and he's gonna commit suicide and Chris Mitchum and Patrick Wayne climb up this tower and they all jump off it's actually a really well done opening scene I'm like ooh this, this might be cool and then it's basically like the towering inferno where this plane carrying a rock star who's played by the guy from Phantom of the Paradise which I thought was funny and Sid Caesar there's a good cast to this I will give it credit for that but Ironic enough, the movie kind of slows down when it gets to the main story. You put all the adrenaline in the opening scene with the radio tower. Then when the plane actually crashes into the building and Chris Mitchum and Patrick Wayne have to rescue the people off of it, it kind of slows down. Like This is a 93-minute pilot film. If this was like a 45-minute with commercials, you know, TV special, I think it would have succeeded. It would have been interesting to see how it would have went with a TV show, but they could have polished it up a little bit more. I know it's a 70s TV thing, but there could have been a little bit more going on. This was an interesting one. I got this mainly because of the cast. Red Fox and Dick Van Dyke. I'm a huge Sanford and Son fan. Red Fox, I love Red Fox. I had never seen this. I, I read the plot, I'm like, okay, I gotta see that. Ghost of a Chance from 1987. If any of you guys have ever seen the 80s comedy The Heavenly Kid, which I love. It's one of my favorite 80s comedies. This is essentially a retelling of that in a way. Obviously, it's a TV movie. It's not as good as The Heavenly Kid. But this is still a fun watch with Red Fox is a you know he's a grandfather he's a musician he's a good guy and dick van dyke is kind of this gun happy ignorant police officer who accidentally ends up shooting and killing red fox and in the same vein as the heavenly kid red fox's ghost has to team up with dick van dyke to help his grandson prepare for this piano recital that he's going to do. And it, it does a lot of the same gags that the Heavenly Kid does, but the cast is really what makes it work. It has a really nice moral to the story that if you guys haven't been living under a rock, me describing the plot of this should bring some recent events to mind that make this still topical as hell. And it has a really sweet ending. Too. It's pretty. It's a pretty touching, 
And I guess this was also supposed to be a TV pilot. Great. It's a 90 minute film, so you know, it works on its own. I don't think this needed to be a TV show. I don't see how it would have lasted, but the way this ends, you can tell that they were going to try to go that route. For Red Vox and Dick Van Dyke, it's a fun watch. I don't know how rare that is to find, but... Now this one was one of the biggest disappointments of this whole thing. Because I'm always looking for obscure movies. I'm always trying to find that gem. You know, I'm always looking for that unknown, like gold or oil. You know, striking oil. Night of the Running Man with Andrew McCarthy and Scott Glenn. I love, it was, and it's directed by Mark L. Lester, you know, Commando. I've loved these, there's a movie with Patrick Dempsey called Run from 1991, and I love that. It's an unknown direct-to-video movie that's tense as hell, and it's really good. So with this cast of Scott Glenn, Andrew McCarthy, John Glover, Don Stark, Wayne Newton has a two-second cameo. I thought this was going to be awesome. I was like, have I finally found the gem? And it has like a six point something IMDb. All the reviews are positive. I got to disagree with them. I thought this was pretty shallow of a thriller. It's okay. Scott Glenn and Andrew McCarthy, they do the best they can, but there's like no character development. It's like John Glover doing his typical cartoony shit. He does the best he can. But at the end of the day, it just feels like a cheap TV movie thriller. Like, there should have been more meat to this. More character development, maybe more action. I wanted more out of this one, Night of the Running Man. Sad to admit that was kind of a disappointment. This one I'm not going to talk about too much, because if anybody knows, this was kind of the site of an awful occurrence, and it shows on screen. It's a bootleg, because I did not want to give the movie the honor of buying that overpriced out-of-print DVD, Clown House. And the shitty thing is, it's not even that bad of a movie, you know, it's, it's a decent you know, it has a feeling, you know, of a Goosebumps type thing. You know, it's about the kids locked in this big mansion with these clowns that are trying to kill them. You know, it's a simple, bare, basic plot. It's a fun... It's, talking about the film on its own here, it's fun. You know, it, it's got that Goosebumps, Are You Afraid of the Dark feel to it. You know, that kid's horror vibe. But it's directed by Victor Salva, and this is the movie where him and the main kid, he was taking advantage of him. And Victor Salva, you can go fuck yourself, you sick, perverted, twisted motherfucker. Yeah, and it's hard to, re I don't want to wreck him. If you could find this for free or cheap where your money is not going indirectly to Victor Selva, give it a watch. There's not too much to it. As I say, it's very simple. Three kids, one of which is, uh, what the fuck's his name? Sam Rockwell. You know, Oscar-winning actor Sam Rockwell. This was his first movie. And he's the only person in this whole entire film that ever amounted to anything else. So it's funny, you know, you got three kids, one of them Sam Rockwell, locked in this big mansion with killer clowns. And there's some really cool, creepy, effective shots. I mean, the three guys playing the three killer clowns, they don't have a word of dialogue, they're just silent. Which actually almost makes the, the movie creepier, in my opinion. But, you know, for Victor Selva, you know, that, that's a weird movie to recommend. Because at the end of the day, I do like it. I enjoyed it, but... And there's just some, like, there's scenes, it's like, do these kids really need to walk around in their underwear in this scene? Like, you know, stuff like that. But this one, Short Time, which I don't know how the fuck this never got an official DVD or Blu-ray release yet in the U.S. This was fun as hell. You know, it's Dabney Coleman. 
thinks he's got a terminal disease due to a guy switching the urine samples at the doctor's office. And the only way his family, who he's kind of estranged from, can get his, uh, like, uh, pension from... He has to get killed in the line of duty. And he's a cop. So you have, you know, the, all these crazy scenes of Dabney Coleman trying to get killed. And he keeps coming out like a hero, and he's being... Hailed and stuff like this was a blast. I love Short Time. I don't want to give too much away about it because I want you guys to see it, but it's a very funny movie that also has awesome action. You got you got to love it when something like this can combine the best of both worlds like that. So definitely seek out. Hopefully that gets a good release, you know, some way somehow. And these next three were sent to me by a very good friend of mine named Dave who specializes in rare TV shows. This first one, I'm a huge fan of that 70s show. It's one of my favorite shows of all time, except for season eight. Fuck season eight. I had heard nothing but bad things about this show. I had known it. I had never seen it. I know it was such a short-lived thing. But because I've got all eight seasons of that 70s show, and I'm such a huge fan of it, I had to complete it for the collection, and it's that 80s show. And you know what? I went into this expecting the worst. I went into this expecting total garbage. And I gotta tell you, the show is not very good. It's not. But it's not really that bad. Like, it lasted 13 episodes, and yeah, I could not have seen this going on much further. It's created by the same people that did that 70s show, and it is so obvious they're just trying to bank on that. Like, the main guy, he is so Eric. <laughs> you know, his character's Eric. He's got the tough girlfriend. You've got the kooky foreigner. Like, there's some overlap like that, obviously. See, the, the main crime with that 80s show, that 70s show was always character-centric always story-centric. The 70s was always in the backdrop. This does the number one worst thing a retro-type show can do. The 80s is the forefront, and character development and storylines all take a backseat. And that's the fatal flaw of a show like this. Like, you do not need... Like, that 70s show never was that reliant on specific references. But like this, like you'll have a scene where the storyline just stops because a character is singing and dancing to love is a battlefield. Like, you don't need shit like that. That's, you know, that's lazy. And part of me wonders how this show could have grown had it kept going, but... It's a dollar store version of that 70s show in the 80s. It's not this mind-numbingly terrible show that people remember it as. At least I didn't think so, but it's not very good. You know, it's definitely a disappointment. This one was a really weird watch. It's this 80s show. It only lasted for six episodes. So I got it from Dave, just kind of as a novelty, just to see what the hell it was. It's this 80s, I don't know if you call it a sitcom or, or what it is. It's called The Popcorn Kid. And it's just this really simple six-episode show about these four teenagers that work in a movie theater and the shit that happens. Well, it, it's, a, it's a very odd like time capsule of a very and Penelope Ann Miller this is where she got her start so it's funny seeing her in this yeah it's a strange strange show I don't know how rare this is I don't know if any of this is on YouTube or not there's only six episodes so yeah it was an odd watch but it's not bad I actually kind of enjoyed it it's so corny and just weird and obscure. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, it was odd, but I liked it. it. Like, there's an episode that's devoted to Ed Asner, 
<laughs> which was funny. And you know, he's on there. Ed Asner shows up, and there's a tornado. Okay, there, there's a character in there that's the goofy projectionist that only speaks in movie quotes. And the, the main kid gets into a fight with this marine because the girl dumps him over the phone. Like, weird stuff. And the last show I got from my friend Dave, I love this movie called Tracks that stars Shadow Stevens. Shadow Stevens was the announcer on the Hollywood Squares, famous TV radio personality. Well, I had never heard of this, but I'm really glad that Dave sent this to me. It's this TV show, it's a cop show called Max Monroe Loose Cannon. It's basically Shadow Stevens doing Miami Vice. It's fun as hell. I, this thing needs to be more well known. Now unfortunately for Dave and Shadow Stevens, because according to Dave, not even Shadow, the very first episode that aired, not the pilot movie, because the pilot movie aired later in the run. The very first episode of this that aired on TV is lost. Nobody has it. But the episodes that we do have on here are all fun as hell. Shadow Stevens does great. You have great guest stars. Tony Todd is in one. Uh, Amy Steele. William Atherton. You have a lot of great people in this was just so funny. It's, it's Shadow Steve, and this is not a picture of him from the show, mind you. This is just some picture. This is not how he appears in the show. It's him doing Miami Vice, and it's just so entertaining. Like, if you can find that, there's an episode in there that takes place in a hospital. It's the funniest shit. Let me just check. How long have I been talking? Do I need... Oh, yeah, 37 minutes, and I still got shit to talk about. I need to hurry this up. Kudos to anyone who's stuck through with me. But no, that was fun as hell. Yeah, the, the intro alone is like, ah. The third and final season of Friday the 13th. This one is kind of, it's a good season. It's got some good episodes. The best of which being this girl in this wicker wheelchair that has to kill people to regain her body. That episode was awesome. But John D. LeMay's character, Ryan, is written out in the weirdest way possible. His character turns into a little boy again, and that's just how he's out of the show. Like, what? And you get this new guy, Johnny, who thankfully he's a good character. You know, it's not like a Randy from that 70s show. But yeah, it's an odd season with some odd episodes, but some of them are really strong. Name, namely, the, the Wicker Wheelchair one is great. Uh, Femme Fatale is fun. Stick It In Your Ear, the hearing aid one, that one was pretty crazy and fun. My Wife as a Dog, that one was actually kind of sad. Coming from someone, I have had to go to a vet's office with my pet to have them put to sleep, it's the worst thing you can do as a human. It's it's one of the most endearing and saddest things. So that episode kind of made me sad, but an odd season. I do like that show, though. It's a really good, nothing to do with the movies, obviously. This was a TV show I bought completely blind just because of this cover. I had never even heard of it before. Wonder Falls. But this was actually a really cool show. Again, only 13 episodes. Fox really shit on this and didn't give it a chance. I think that's a damn shame because this was an underrated show. I really enjoyed this. It's about this girl who has these, not really visions, but kind of like fake animals that can talk to her and she could has to help people in their lives. Oh God, William Sadler's in it as her dad, and she's got these kooky friends, and there's this romance subplot with her and this bartender who has this ex-wife. And This was a fun show. It, I think it's a... I, I would have loved to see this get a bigger chance. 
The best episode of this is called Love Sick Ass. It's about this little kid who orders a Russian mail order bride. And it is hilarious. If you watch one episode of this show, watch that. But yeah, it's a, it's a shame this never took off more. Wonderful. It's, it's quirky. It's goofy. It's surreal. But I really loved it. And if you like obscure TV shows, definitely give it's from 2004 so de definitely seek out Wonder Falls it's a good that was that's a good underrated show I've shown these in every DVD update you know me connecting with my childhood the real wheels this is rescue adventures which comes with there goes a rescue hero which is the last real wheels video Dave Hood ever made there goes a police car a classic with Dave and Becky there goes a rescue vehicle, another classic with Dave and Becky. I love these Dave Hood real wheels. I'm not, I, I, I need to get this done because this has gone on too long. If you want to hear me talk about what real wheels is and who Dave Hood is, just watch my previous updates. Thank you, Dave Hood. You guys are going to laugh at me for this one, but I don't give a shit. Another one from my childhood section of my DVD collection. This is Thomas and Friends Percy's Ghostly Trick. Now, this is Thomas and Friends from the late 80s and into the early 90s when George Carlin was narrating it. And I stand by my statement. A lot of talent goes into this show from the models, the sets, the atmosphere, the music. Seriously, Percy's Ghostly Trick, they got some eerie stuff in that episode. Escape is a great episode I remember from my childhood. And All at Sea, which has this strange moral about life to it. As I said, this is when kids' shows were professional. They were deep. They had emotion. And they had storylines without being too kiddish, as opposed to any kids' show of today. So that's why I'm happy to have this in my collection. And I will defend this as long as I'm here, because... You can laugh at me all you want, but I'm happy to have that as a part of my collection now. Because I have a whole section of my collection dedicated to childhood stuff. This was another freebie. It's this weird... <laughs> Cruise in Review. Royal Caribbean Cruises. My understanding of what... I got this for free at a pawn shop. My understanding of what this is, is you would buy these on Royal Caribbean Cruises... They were custom for the cruise you were on. So, like, for example, this one is from January 2005, number 34. So if you were on the Royal Caribbean cruise, number 34, and you're featured on Cruise in Review DVD number 34, I got you. <laughs> it's a random... Most of this video is just obese fat men dancing. But there's a really funny behind-the-scenes option on there where this Australian guy is going through the broadcasting room on a cruise ship. It was actually kind of interesting. So yeah, that's a just an odd, obscure little freebie I got. Three more. Okay, guys, bear with me. South Park, the complete 10th season. One of my favorite seasons of the show. I love South Park. I'm getting fucking hot doing this <laughs> This episode right here, Miss Teacher Bangs a Boy. One of the best episodes of cartoon history ever. As is this one you see here, which was the war the war of world the war of world Craft. World of Warcraft episode, which you got how can you not love it for? Live to win till you die. So yeah, between Miss Teacher Bangs a Boy and Make Love, Not Warcraft, South Park Season 10, one of the best seasons of the show. And last but definitely not least, Season 2 of King of the Hill, which somehow I skipped when I was buying all of them before, and Season 11. Season 2 is one of the best seasons of the show. You've got the great... You've got the great Texas City Twister episode where the tornado comes through. Halloween, one of the funnest Halloween shows. 
And, oh, Hank going blind from seeing his parents having sex, or his mom having sex with her boyfriend. The one where they go to Mexico with Khan, and they have to sneak back over the border. You know, that's great. Season two, this is, this is fun. And if only Fox, for some reason, season one and two are the only two seasons that have this, where they did character commentaries on the episodes. It's such a fun gimmick for this. I don't know why they stopped doing that. But season two is fun, as is season 11. The funnest episode on here is Grand Theft Arlen, where they make a video game based on Arlen, to, and it's great. It's funny. Watch Grand Theft Arlen. That episode cracked me up. As well as the one where the real Rusty Shackleford showed up to confront Dale. So, King of the Hill, one of my favorite cartoons of all time. And unlike The Simpsons and Family Guy and all that, it actually kept its integrity the whole way through. I got, I got the last two seasons now. Got to get so Because that's season 11, there's 13 total. So, Okay, guys, if you've watched this this long, comment something in the comments because I applaud your, your perseverance to stick through this whole thing for this long. I've talked way too fucking long. Thank you guys for watching. Take care. We'll see you next time. 46 minutes. There we go. All right, guys. Seriously, thanks for watching. Hope you liked it. Leave your thoughts in the comments for whatever you think about all of those. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks very much.